Hello and welcome to the second video in this series on academic practice looking at essay writing. As mentioned in video one on critical thinking, the advice largely speaks to those studying arts and humanities subjects, but should also apply to other areas of interest. Based on issues I've encountered when marking essays, I'll cover preparation, presentation, structure and general observations. Many of the points are transferable to any kind of academic assessment and I recommend viewing this video alongside the next ones looking at delivering presentations and sitting exams. Good writing is all in the editing. Essay assignments present an opportunity for your ideas and research to shine. If you're given a deadline well in advance, taking the time to prepare thoroughly and redraft your work will pay dividends. Taking on board the following suggestions may also help improve your techniques and grades. Carefully study the primary texts as they will likely provide the answers and basis for your ideas. Good notes and plans can develop into paragraphs and cogent arguments. Consult supporting sources that are academically viable, that is, avoid websites such as Wikipedia or the Internet Movie Database. While they do prove useful sometimes, such sites are unregulated and some information can be inaccurate. Plan out the flow of the essay and a timeline for researching, writing and editing it. These can be adapted as you go. It's useful to have plans and schedules to keep you on track and to help manage stress. Get the first draft done well before the due date so you have something to redraft and strengthen with time to spare. Forward planning could be the difference between grade boundaries. First impressions count. How your essay looks when it reaches your examiner may impact on your overall mark. Make it easy for your marker by adhering to clear presentation and an appropriate style guide. Ensure you know the basics of formatting Word documents. Paying attention to detail in all areas of your work bodes well. Remember, during your studies, you are also building transferable skills that are attractive to employers. If your work is presented in a clear, organised fashion that meets expected standards, it shows that you pay due care and have consideration for your reader. A house style guide usually provided by your institution explains how to present your essay, including font, text size, line spacing, margins, paragraphs, image inserts, page numbers, and so on. It tells you how to acknowledge sources of information, so for example, in text or parenthetical citations or footnotes. It gives you ways to present short or long quotations, and you should always type any quoted text as it appears in the original. And if you do emphasize part of it, you need to say so. A style guide will tell you how to compile a works cited or a references list. It tells you what kinds of spellings to use. For example, it might distinguish between UK or US English, and these distinctions are usually really important. Um, it will tell you how to present numbers and dates because there are different formats for those things that are appropriate as well. And it will tell you how to present foreign language terms. Additionally, you should include the question or the title of your essay at the top of the first page. This is a great help to examiners and seeing it every time you open your document should also encourage you to reread the question and to make sure that you don't veer off topic. The expression and tone in your essay is really important. You should speak directly and spare adjectives for when you really need them. Excluding unnecessary words helps attain clarity and concision. Avoid using slang and colloquialisms. It's important to find a consensus on whether to refer to yourself or to use passive voice. 
I tend to go for active voice. For example, this essay examines framing and character blocking in Bell, directed by Ama Santi. And then you can make direct statements that unambiguously communicate uh, what you think about the topic and why, drawing on evidence to support any claims that you make. It's advisable to read around your topic so that you can see how different scholars present their ideas and decide for yourself what styles are clear and convincing to you. And maybe you can model yours on ones you think are, are really good at that. Overall, it should never be a battle to read. Paragraphs should have flow within themselves and connect to each other so the whole text flows and carries the reader smoothly and rationally through ideas. Avoid florid academic language. Just try not to run before you can walk. On screen, I've placed a partial draft paragraph with some of these suggestions put in practice. Feel free to pause and read it through uh, and stop and, and think about it really carefully. Avoid glorifying your subject. You don't have to be a fan to engage with primary sources. Analysis and descriptions should maintain neutrality and objectivity as much as is appropriate. Assessments are not reviews. Whether or not you like a work has no bearing on your analysis of it. Wasting words on irrelevant, evaluative comments may lose you marks. Know the difference between analysis and more journalistic criticism and reviews. It's obvious to examiners when a term has been misapplied or misunderstood. Always seek clarification and make sure you're applying terms appropriately, lest you dismantle otherwise really sound work. Discuss the text directly, what it does, how it does it and what significance this has. Only draw on biographical information about the author or maker if you can evidence its relevance to your points. With quotations, firstly remember that it is your argument. Use your words to make it and others' words to support it. Be careful not to crowd out your own voice and thoughts with too many others. Second resources provide supporting evidence. Use them to back you up and keep you right, not to speak for you. It's a tricky balance though, as your research will introduce you to knowledge you wouldn't know otherwise. And this must be credited and woven into your argument, particularly if you're outlining necessary context early on. Avoid dropping in quotations and expecting them to make your points. If discussing others' points to build your own, situate them in their own contexts and this will show your knowledge, understanding and your capacity for research and explain what bearing they have on your argument. Examine them and apply the ideas when analysing primary texts. Avoid using long quotations that eat up word count. This is a really obvious ploy and it's quite jarring to read. Lead into quotations, introduce them and weave them into your discussion. For example, you could say, Bell Hooks states that, instead of just putting in the quotation, it just makes it easier for the reader and it's a bit more respectful to the author. Paraphrasing is a really useful skill. Still acknowledging and citing appropriate texts Paraphrasing someone else's ideas can show how clearly you grasp the material by conveying it in your own words. Acknowledge all sources from which you have gathered information, including work you paraphrase or mention. Follow the referencing system as directed by whomever will read the essay, be it your school, college, university, editors, whoever. In-text citations must be within punctuation, but footnotes must come directly after punctuation. 
always include a full work cited at the end. Depending on your subject, this may be split into primary and secondary texts, or a bibliography with a filmography or videography, and so on. Strong essay introductions tend to convey the following without you narrating constantly that you are in fact doing these things. Your understanding of the question or topic and any relevant terms that need to be flagged up early. Concise statements on the most relevant context. How the essay responds to the question, for example, what primary and secondary sources and ideas construct the discussion framework what conclusions your argument draws, and perhaps a sense of how your specific topic connects with or is indicative of larger issues begging deeper examination. In short, the introduction should provide a map that signposts your arguments and how and why you're making them. For this reason, it might be best to write your introduction last or redraft it when your essay is finished. Does your first draft conclusion read as a stronger opening paragraph? Outline all relevant contexts and issues in the second and third paragraphs, including relevant and concise descriptions of your focus texts. Even if your examiner knows them well, you must show that you do too. Whether it's a point you're making or a descriptive analysis, describe it clearly, explaining what the text does and how it does it, then convincingly posit the significance of what you've observed. Tie this in with the larger argument by linking it directly with the other points you make in response to the question. Generally, new points need new paragraphs and each paragraph should link to the next. Your building points should form a kind of narrative. Convincing arguments are built on going into greater detail on indicative examples of the most relevant aspects of the study texts. If it is a compare and contrast essay, for example, choosing corresponding sections from the text that most effectively evidence your points is a good strategy. Showing the breadth of your knowledge is great, but it's important to show depth as well. Conclusions are tricky and it is okay to find them difficult to write. Do not estimate the usefulness of the penultimate paragraph. It should be the culmination of the argument threads pulling together. Good conclusions tend not to present any new strands to the argument. While essays for examination should summarise and reiterate the argument, be concise and avoid repetition. The final paragraph presents an opportunity to think again about the bigger picture. If you're struggling with a conclusion, try using it to address questions such as, has your discussion stumbled upon further issues begging attention? Can you shed new light about the broader context she pointed out early on? Does your argument show that there could have been a more appropriate question to address? If so, why and how might that be undertaken? Consider the reader. The easier you can make the work read, the quicker it will be marked. For example, never make examiners hunt for information. Make it readily available by explaining, providing evidence or reiterating what was stated previously. Always provide reasoning for your ideas and why you present them the way you do. Spell check and proofread your work carefully. Engage in peer review whenever possible. Use a dictionary and a thesaurus. Avoid making assumptions about how implied readers or viewers of your focus texts receive and engage with them. Such generalised, unevidenced statements may be irrelevant anyway. Equally, avoid assuming directorial or authorial intent. Even if makers intend something, it doesn't mean it's in the finished product or is relevant to your argument. Your teachers, tutors or lecturers spend significant time compiling suggested reading. 
It's really frustrating when students ignore set texts. They're provided with good reason. They're there to give you a really good basis for your research. Consulting texts that you end up ruling out is still useful. Elimination is part of a robust research process and all reading helps you become clearer about your own positions. The exercise is to make a convincing argument within the limitations of the word count. See it as a positive challenge rather than a restriction or an unattainable target. You're not expected to show everything. Showing a lot about a little with relevance to the assignment is the best strategy. Try to get your word count as close to the limit as possible. You may have some leeway and most universities will allow minus or 10% for example without penalising the mark and you should check whether this includes your referencing or not. If you go way over the limit, read through and strip out any unnecessary words or phrases and see where you can be more succinct. For example, uh, very often when people say the ways in which, this can be replaced really easily with just the word how. If you are way under the limit, think through your points and examples carefully. Can you add more evidence or detail? If in doubt, give it a citation. Do not risk being accused of plagiarism. Take on board any feedback you get and do not take it to heart. It is usually constructive criticism designed to help you improve. Take breaks and leave enough time to read your work with fresher eyes well before submission. If you find this presentation interesting or useful, please share and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And thanks so much to all of those of you who have already. I provide these videos for free, but they take a lot of time and work to prepare. If you feel able to make a financial contribution to their production, please consider donating in British Pounds via paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair or perhaps pay a monthly subscription of an amount of your choice, anything at all, in US dollars on patreon.com forward slash PEA Blair. Pledges of any amount on Patreon will enable access to transcriptions of my videos and these include bibliographical references and links to further information. My Patreon page also links to my audio recordings, blog posts and publications. Any money received goes towards sustaining and improving the educational resources I make and will facilitate the development of a website that I'm designing dedicated to wide accessible study of audiovisual cultures. Thank you so much for joining me. If you got to the end, well done. And I really hope you'll join me again next time. All the best.